Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Philip Day. I'm uh, Assistant Professor and Associate Director of Education at the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at UMass Penn Medical School. I'm also on the uh, advisory committee for the Bring Your Brave um, Hereditary Breast Cancer uh, Pilot Project, of which you are all a part. Um, and I'm pleased to be uh, moderating this session tonight on quality improvement basics. Um, and we'll shortly introduce our speaker, uh, Kathy Frederick. Like there we go. Um, so this is one of the three required trainings um, and participating family physicians will be eligible to claim um, some CMEs for, for this pilot project. And as you can see, the next uh, training date will be on uh, February 1st. One second, everybody. Um, a, a PDF of the slides along with the link to this recording will be available and emailed to you within a few days of this presentation. Um, uh, Ms. Fredericks is going to be going through uh, quite a few slides on basics of QI, so that we ask that you please keep yourself on mute until the end of the presentation. If you have any um, questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat, but we do have a dedicated Q&A session uh, near the end uh, of tonight's uh, presentation, and then we'd uh, be happy to help have you unmute yourself, raise your hand, put stuff in the chat, whatever, however it is that you'd like to uh, ask your question or make your comment, um, please feel free to do so. So you can see our acknowledgements here, um, the funding through the federal government, through the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, CDC, um, and uh, we're just happy to be working through FMEC to be able to bring this um, opportunity to y'all. And again, I'm, as a member of the uh, advisory council, I've learned a lot and really appreciated being part of this uh, project. So I'm glad that you're here tonight as well. Um, so again, we have received uh, credit for this for you to get um, some uh, CME hours to the AAFP. All of this should be, uh, shouldn't be news to you, you should know this already. I'm going to get through this. We have no conflicts of interest, financial, moral, ethical, whatever, otherwise to, to disclose. We have no financial relationships. We have no products or anything like that that we're going to be discussing um, tonight. Here's your objectives. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, essentially we're going to, Ms. Fredericks is going to be going through the basics of QI, looking at improvement models, talking about aim statements, quality improvement teams, and then looking at at least, you know, what I know of as the most sort of uh, common or you know, important is the right word, but um, effective model for QI is the PDSA, the plan that uh, do study act cycles for uh, practice improvement. And then, like I said, we'll have a Q&A um, there at the end. Sorry, everyone. So uh, today's presenter is Kathy Frederick, um, who has been a delight to work with for the last six months or so. I'm not, I'm not, I can't remember exactly when, Kathy. Sorry. It's, uh, yeah. I think I've lost months. control. Yeah, about six months. Um, and uh, one second, everybody. Sorry, I keep losing my thing here. Um, Ms. Frederick uh, provides program direction as a um, specialist on QI uh, and as a, as a consultant. Um, Previously employed with the Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics for 18 years, serving 10 years as associate executive director of that um, association. Prior to that, um, Ms. Frederick served with the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, a national medical association with over 64,000 members, including a decade-long role in the position of director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Health. She has a much longer bio. Um, but we're going to uh, go ahead and uh, continue with the presentation. So I hope you will join me in welcoming um, Kathy Fredericks as our expert speaker tonight. Kathy, let's uh, take it away. Great. Thank, thank you, Philip, for that intro. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm really excited to welcome everybody to the project. And again, this, this is our second training, and we're going to focus on QI basics. So um, in order to get started, I the first question I put out there for everybody is, uh, what is the model for improvement? So we're going to get into it, but basically think of it in terms of it being a method for healthcare practitioners to use to improve processes and patient outcomes. And using the model requires practitioners to uh, be comfortable with implementing change. And over time, you'll develop mastery in terms of implementing the model, which will help you um, when you're doing your QI activities. Um, and the model was embraced by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement back in the 1970s and 80s. And this helped launch Q QI learning collaboratives across the country that started many years ago. And I'm sure some of the older faculty that are 
um, involved in this project may have even been involved in some of those collaboratives because they they did they ran collaboratives on things like diabetes and heart disease and stroke. And so the model for improvement has been out there for a while and it lends itself um, very well to um, QI projects related to healthcare. Okay, let's see. Okay, um, so the model for improvement actually was developed by Dr. W. Edward Stemming. And he also um, created um, an organization that's called Associates in Process Improvement. And so the model for improvement, it's a powerful tool uh, for accelerating improvement. And there's another resource that I like to use in my work. Um, it's called the Improvement Guide. And that's another source where you can learn more about this model. And it's not meant to replace or change models that organizations may already be using, but rather use it to accelerate improvement through the use of the PDSA um, improvement cycle. And this, the second edition here was published in 2009, and it offers an integrated approach to learning designed to deliver quick and substantial results. So the authors drew, uh, look, looked at research around a variety of different industries and areas, um, including manufacturing, healthcare, government, and schools. And within this guide, they have some uh, practical um, ideas and examples and applications for how to implement the model for improvement. So that's a, just a resource out there if you want to learn more. So um, who is Edward Stemming? Well, he was born in um, October of 1900, and he was an American engineer, statistician, professor, author, lecturer, and a management consultant. And he received his PhD from Yale University in mathematics and physics. And he um, um, also is known for helping to develop the sampling techniques still used by the US Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And Deming championed the work of another um, guru in quality um, improvement, and his name was Dr. Walter Schuhart. So Schuhart actually started to develop the PDSA cycle, and then Deming refined it and made it more widely available through his work. Um, so I just like to throw those little things out there. And uh, Dr. Deming also was um, doing QI in the United States and also in other countries. So he's, he's quite famous for having helped Japan uh, re rebound after World War II and develop a lot of its process improvement initiatives to get so that you know, Japan could get back on its feet economically. Um, and so he was well known for that. And then uh, Re Pre President Ronald Reagan awarded him the National Medal of Technology in 1987. And then the following year, the National Academy of Sciences gave Deming the Distinguished Career in Science Award. So what is the Deming Cycle? So the Deming cycle, it's a continuous quality improvement model, which consists of a logical sequence of plan, do, study, and act. And Deming emphasized the PDSA cycle and not so much the PDCA cycle. So the C stands for check. So he put an emphasis on the study and not the check. Um, and Deming found that fo a focus on check is more about the implementation of a change with success or failure and his focus was more on predicting the results of an improvement. So in other, in other words, like coming up with a hypothesis or a theory that to test out and then study the actual results through the PDSA cycles and then compare them and to possibly revise your theory or your, um, your hypotheses to see whether or not the result that you got through, through the exercise resulted in an improvement or not. And so he stressed that the need, there was a need to develop new knowledge from learning, and that has, has always guided his work. Um, so by comparison, the check phase of the C PDCA cycle focuses on success or failure of a plan, um, and um, the PDSA cycle focuses more on um, implementing um, and making change, um, positive change through process improvements. And there's some other... Uh, QI terminology out there that's widely used. So we talked about PDSA and the PDCA. 
I think people have heard of the rapid cycle quality improvement. So this is a this is something I see more in the world of nursing around nursing QI. And then we've all we've all heard about SMART, and we know that mnemonic for SMART SMART stands for um, measures that are specific, spe measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And so uh, I think we use SMART a lot in our own personal lives. And that's more of a tool that's um, where you can get results in the fields of project management or like employee performance management and like personal development. Um, so that's kind of its distinction between SMART and then the model for improvement and PDSA. And then the other thing we've heard about are, are things like Lean or Six Sigma. And that, that that's a set of methodologies and tools that are used to improve business processes um, and uh, like, for example, by reducing defects and errors in manufacturing to minimize variation and to increase quality and efficiency. So in summary, the model for improvement and PDSA cycles is the preferred QI method in the healthcare field. And according to the Institute of Medicine, a healthcare system that achieves major gains in these six areas on this, on this slide are far better at meeting patient needs. And it's for this reason that we encourage you to consider these aims in your improvement work. And studies have shown that progress in these six areas can reduce healthcare costs and it can improve patient outcomes over time. So the IOM aims for improvement are um, ensuring uh, that what you're working on, it, that it's safe, that it's effective, it, that it's patient and family centered, it's done in a timely manner, and it's efficient and equitable. And the American College of Graduate Medical Education and the American Board of Medical Specialties also has four competencies that they refer to um, in their QI work. And those include patient care. So um, when you're working on your QI activities, the focus will generally be around these some of these six areas. So you can address pa patient care, you can address medical knowledge, you can focus on practice-based learning and improvement. Um, you can have a focus on systems-based practice, so spreading change from a, a clinic into a system or a health system, and then um, developing professional professionalism and um, being aware of the interpersonal skills and communication that you need in order to have a successful um, project. So the next step in um, in the QI work is um, you're going to want to um, form uh, a QI team. And well, um, so you and I want to identify a practice champion. And right now we're talking about QI in general, not specifically about the HBC project yet, but uh, luckily for our project, we already have identified our QI leaders within each of the FMR family medicine residency programs. So that's wonderful. So, but just in general, for any QI project, you have to identify your practice champion. And then you want to uh, work with leaders who have QI experience. And then also that have relationships with people internally and externally to bring some new knowledge and help bring some structure around your project. And then you're going to want to assemble your QI team. And when you're assembling your QI team, you want to bring people into the team that are going to be representative of all areas of your um, your practice, for example. So, so if you're working on a healthcare um, QI activity where you want to improve something for patient care, you want to make sure that part of your team includes nursing, if they're involved, um, physician assistants, physicians, it could be the front desk receptionist. It could be um, a variety of people within your organization or within your your uh, clinic or your your program that you would want to bring onto the team. And then also be th thinking about how you can include patients as partners in care. So family representatives or patients um, are important to be thinking about to bring onto your team. So as you're developing your QI framework, um, you want to um, practice some certain steps. And the first thing might be to, to develop some team guidelines on how your QI team is going to function. And you want to develop your staff member's skills. So perhaps your staff is going to need some education on the area that you're trying to tackle in terms of improving care 
for patients. So maybe if it was going to be on um, management of diabetes or asthma or cancer, like screening for cancer, um, you want to you want to let you want to make sure that your the staff there are going to be involved in making and implementing the changes. Understands like why you're what you're doing is important and what what the, what education they need to get themselves up to speed so that they can actively contribute to the process. And that's one way you can develop a, 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 a culture for QI. And then you wanna keep your practice staff informed of your efforts. And then just remember, we all know this, but it's not always easy to effectively communicate, but that will be the, the success, that, that will be an indicator of success for your project. So um, generally speaking, how, how does one come up with um, ideas for change? Um, so we know that for paying attention in our day-to-day -day work, sometimes we hear complaints from our patients or staff. And if you hear a complaint about this, a, the same issue a few times, you know, that should be on your radar and a red flag, like maybe maybe there's a, some something we could do to improve this or to like make this be not not a complaint. Um, or maybe when you're coming up for ideas, um, your you, let's just say your your practice needs to respond to a, some city or state requirements, like like young kids uh, are required to have lead testing, and maybe that process isn't running as smoothly as it could. So that could be an area where you could test out like. Um, the process for getting lead testing done and then getting the results conveyed back to families is one example. STD screening is another example. And there's a lot of other examples around compliance where you can envision a QI project could be helpful. Another area would be addressing a public health need. And so you've all, you all already um, participated in a lot of things related to COVID and trying to get those immunization rates back up and, you know, recommending uh, the HPV vaccine for cancer prevention. Those are all areas that are commonly uh, pursued for QI activities. And then you can always look to the medical literature and then also brainstorm with your team to come up with other ideas. So when you're working on your AIM statement, you want to think about what the characteristics of an AIM statement are. So the very first characteristic is you want to try to write an AIM statement that's clear. So you want you and your staff to be able to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish without interpretation and uh, what, you know, why and know why you're working on it. And then you would like for your aim statement to be numeric. And so this would include quantifiable measures to track progress. And you want your aim statement to also be a stretch. You don't want it to be so simple that you're really not pushing yourselves to achieve the best outcome. So you want it to be a bit of a stretch. So you want to set the goal high enough so achieving it will have a significant impact on patient care. And then you want it to be focused. So by referring to the aim statement regularly, then people involved in an improvement effort can avoid drifting away from what the intent was and it will help them to stay focused on the work so they don't get discouraged or overwhelmed. And in this slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the importance of developing aim statements to guide your improvement work. So aim statements are an essential component of improvement science. And here are some tips for writing effective aim statements. You're going to want your aim statement to answer a question. The overall arching question is, what are we trying to accomplish? So it articulates the results you hope to see because of the changes you're making. And an aim statement should be carefully worded to include a description of how much improvement is desired. And it should include the specific population that is the focus of the improvement efforts. And it should talk about the amount of time it's going to take to achieve the aim. And then it's going to also focus the um, your improvement efforts um, overall on achieving the aim. So it should be based on improvements you would like to see relevant to quality gaps that have been identified. So over time, as you're getting into the QI work, you'll be wanting to re ask yourself, well, what are we trying to change? And then what will change for whom, by when, and for how much? 
And so this slide gets down further into um, the model for improvement. And just keep in mind, when working on an AIM, remember to implement small tests of change. It is highly recommended to measure progress in small increments for QI purposes. And this is the preferred method util utilized by the American Board of Family Physicians, as well as many other medical boards. Um, and so the next few slides, uh, we're gonna get into the model for improvement. So as you do it though, remember those three questions. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in, improve, in improvement? And so now here um, is the PDSA graphic that's uh, broken down into even more detail. So once your team has selected an idea to try out, the next step is to test it. And so the PDSA, PDSA cycle is used to, to conduct rapid tests of change on a small scale so you can learn from the results and apply the learning to the next test cycle. So the cycle links the tests of change, it refines the process with each iteration until the redesign process is ready for broad scale implementation. And so if you take a few minutes to just look at this slide, you know, you're gonna start with the planning you're gonna have an objective and you're gonna have um, like a hypothesis and you're gonna come up with a prediction. Like, why are we working on this? And then what is the plan to carry it, carry it, out, carry it out? You're gonna to have to address the who, what, where, and the when. And then as you're doing, as you're carrying out the plan, um, you're gonna to wanna to document problems that and unexpected observations that have come up. And you wanna to begin to analyze the data in real time as, as you're working on it. And then you're going to study the results, you're going to do an analysis, and you're going, to you're going to compare your data to the predictions you made. And then you want to summarize the learning and uh, see how it relates to the actions that you're going to be taking. So what changes are you going to make that will result in an improvement? And um, PDSAs could be done in a half a day in the clinic once you have this written out and you know what you're testing. And you don't have to spend a long time on it. You, and you can uh, debrief after like two or three test cases of like trying to implement a change, talk rapidly in a, in a huddle, what worked, what didn't, and then you can tweak it right there on the spot and you can go on and test it uh, in the next after, afternoon even if, if the people involved in trying to make the improvement are, are there. So um, when we talk about um, using PDSA cycles, the, I'm gonna give you some tips for successful cycles. So again, as I mentioned, begin with baby steps, start very small, run your cycles in rapid succession, and then think about uh, these seven ideas of repeating the attempts, assessing regularly, communicating with the participants during the planning phase, communicate what's frequently with the staff so they understand what you're doing and how it's evolving. And be a strong presence in your practice um, as you're implementing these PDSA cycles. Recognize the team efforts and then learn from successes and failures. So uh, PDSAs also um, are, include uh, measures. So let's talk a little bit about measures. There's going to be four types of QI metrics, outcome, process, balancing, and structure. And when you're evaluating measures, you want to ask questions to determine if the changes are causing a positive or a negative impact. And so for outcome measures, ask, did my change impact my problem and my aim statement the way I thought it would? And am I fixing the problem my project hopes to fix? And for process measures, ask, how did I make the change? And then always consider balancing and structural changes, such as like, for balancing, you want to think about, is the change causing another problem I didn't consider? or is, And is the change positive or negative? And then for structure, keep in mind that that's something that's usually done once. It's not like a monthly measure, and it usually doesn't have a yes or no answer. Um, so a structural change might be like, maybe you've made a decision, like you're going to do some screening questionnaires, and you're going to have the MAs uh, give the questionnaires to the patients while they're in the waiting room, just as an example. And um, then the MAs will collect the questionnaires, score it, and then give it to the provider to discuss with the patient. 
So like that's a structural thing where you've assigned an MA to do something. Um, but then you're going to want to test out whether it's actually happening happening that way. And is that is that working? Is that structure working? So here I wrote out an aim statement, and this is um, this is around an education aim statement. But I just wanted to give it as an example, and we're going to have two examples of an aim statement, and then we're going to talk more specifically about the of the current project. But um, so when you're creating an aim statement, so for example, this is an example of a statement related to an early Head Start program. So the aim reads by August of 2023. So it's time specific. The, the QI team will improve the literacy skills, or not the QI team, but whatever, the, the Head Start team will improve the literacy, literacy skills of young children in an early Head Start program. And they're going to screen 200 children. Excuse me, my, my slides are advancing quick, quicker than I thought. Uh, for the 200 children, uh, we're going to design interventions. Who Of the 200 children that need an intervention, we're going to design an intervention for 90% or more of those who need literacy development. So these kids are prepared for kindergarten. So this is an, an advance of kindergarten to help prepare kids for literacy development. So in this example, we did state, when are we going to do it? We're going to do it from January to August. And what did we do? We're trying to make sure children are pre-literacy prepared for kindergarten. And how did we do it? We screened 200 kids for readiness and reading preparation. And of the 200, we referred 40 for pre-literacy support before the start of kindergarten. So that was 20%. And then who is better off? So of the 40 children, let's just say four families didn't follow through. They couldn't get their kids to get their pre-literacy support. So overall, um, you know, 10% of those 40 kids um, didn't get didn't get the support that they needed, but we did achieve our overall aim statement of supporting 90% um, of kids. Um, so that's an example of an aim statement. I guess it was kind of a complex one, but here's a healthcare related aim statement. So this is talking about asthma management. So by August, 2023, XYZ family practice will create a registry or a list of patients with chronic asthma, or let's just say uncontrolled asthma. You know, the wording and the terminology is gonna be specific to what you're actually trying to address. So this is just an example. And then the numeric goals and the measures are gonna be, you're gonna be trying to make sure that 90% of patients that have a diagnosis of asthma are identifiable via ICD codes within the EMR. So this is an example of learning how to use your ICD-10 codes to pull patient records um, to help you in developing lists of patients that need an intervention or need to be put on a registry. And then 50% or more of the patients that are in the registry over 12 months, you're gonna to work towards trying to create a co-created asthma action plan. So this is an example of an AIM statement and how, and how you would go about writing one. So um, in, the, in this example um, of the AIM statement relating to asthma, um, this AIM statement contains measures related to asthma. And so these measures are verifiable um, so about, you either did create a registry or you did it. And um, there also um, are things that you'll want to discuss with your team. You're going to want to ask them questions about whether or not the team thinks that what you're doing is working. And you also want to think about what other practices have done um, that could help you with your QI work. Now, this is an example of how to display data. So as you're going through your QI project or your AIM statement or whatever your activity is doing, you wanna be able to look at your data and your data can tell a story. So this is a run chart, excuse me. This is a run chart that provides data on the percent of asthma patients that have received a flu shot during the months of March to June. So let's just pretend we're in the Southern hemisphere, which is the opposite of the seasons for us. So let's just say we're in Argentina. And um, so you 
uh, you, this rod chart it helps us to describe the story. So if you look at this, Dr. McKenna is the doctor who's trying to make a change. And he has, a, as a goal, he would like to see 95% of his asthma patients receive flu shots. Um, however, the benchmark of what's actually happening in as of March uh, was like 35 or like 30 percent of patients were getting flu shots. So he did an intervention and he tested it out. The intervention was to put signs at the front desk, put signs in the clinic, remind people, get your flu shot. You're here. Let's get your shot done today. So that that so that's an annotation within a run chart. And that's uh, very helpful for people to see like what was the intervention and how did it help or not? So in this case, it did help some, but then by May, it's kind of fell down again. And then it was time to initiate um, another um, thing to test out. So they wanted to test out doing some pre-visit planning. Um, and so through the pre-visit planning, they were able to get their numbers up. So now that they're at 60%. So this is just as an example of using run charts and bar graphs and things to display your QI data to tell the story. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the need for the, what we're working on right now. So when you're working on quality improvement, some of the things you want to talk about are, well, what, like, what's the need? So if you think about the HBC project, hereditary breast cancer, we know that family physicians and other primary care providers are at the heart of early prevention and early detection of cancer. And this is particularly true of hereditary cancers. So we know that the family physicians are uniquely positioned to assess their patients' risks and counsel them and that the patients have a relationship. And so that's a trusted source that they could go to to ask questions. Um, and so family physicians are have the trust to help support their patients to evaluate their risk for any kind of cancer, for example, um, and also to help them talk about how they can reduce their risk. So that's the need for the QI project that we're getting, getting going on. And so, when you're looking at your problem statement, you also want to look at the data. So we know that with an estimated 10% of cancer diagnoses linked to a high risk gen genetic mutation, identifying and counseling those individuals who carry the mutation can save lives. So that's, we know that if we do something, if we, if we address it, we're actually going to be saving lives. And according to the CDC, only about 41% of primary care physicians are referring women with a high risk for breast cancer for genetic counseling and testing. So that's a gap and there's a lot of room for improvement. And so in order to address the problem through the HBC QI pilot project, here are some of the components that we'll be working on. The, the Family Medicine Education Consortium in conjunction with um, the National um, Association of Chronic Disease Directors and with the support we're getting through the CDC, we'll be able to provide coaching to help drive development of policies, processes, and improvements to address HBC risk assessment in practice. And this effort is organized into four areas. So we're going to begin by identifying and implementing, we would like the we would like the family medicine res residency programs to be able to identify and implement an HBC risk assessment or screening questionnaire in practice. And you learned about that a little bit in the first training. And we'll be talking about that again in the third training when we get into the QI project structure. Um, but you're also gonna be learning about and utilizing the Bring Your Brave CDC resources. And we talked about that in the first training. And we hope that you're starting to go to the website and explore all those resources. And the, we have a whole list, and I shared this with some of the people who attended the first session, and I'll send it out for people today and, and for the next one. We have a list of like an index of the Bring Your Brave um, educational patient materials that relate to small little video clips that you could share with patients in practice. So we, we are incorporating that as part of our project to be doing that. And then... Uh, we want to be able to refer patients who screen positive for HBC for genetic counseling or testing. 
And when we did the demographic survey of the eight family medicine residency programs, um, we learned that like, uh, I think it was six out of the eight are already have a resource for genetic counseling and testing and two don't. So through this project, we can help each of the sites um, get into this deeper and we can help you find more resources. And then in the longer term, not the short term of this really short QI pilot, but in the longer term, it would be awesome if at the end of the, this pilot, um, each of the family medicine residency programs were able to develop a mechanism or a patient alert or a way to flag a patient in the medical record um, if, if they're determined to have a high risk for breast cancer or any kind of cancer, um, to have that be um, um, an alert and on, on the provider's mind to be monitoring and looking at what kind of ongoing cancer prevention and early detention care that these patients need. So um, the HPC QI pilot project aim statement. So not necessarily, um, so these are like for the overall project are as follows. By starting, and let's just say we're starting in July, not, oh, excuse me, January. So we're starting in January, we're doing our trainings and we're kicking off the project. So now we're gonna run through June and then into July, uh, but we're gonna wrap up, we're gonna try to wrap up most of this work by the end of June. But by July 2024, we'd like to increase by 50%. And here I want to, when I'm talking about the number of family physicians, I'm talking about within this cohort. So within the eight programs that we're going to be working with, we would like you to be able to increase by 50% the number of family physicians in, in the programs who are screening for HBC and documenting findings in the patient records. And by July of 2024, we would like to offer 90% of patients who screen positive for high risk of HBC with CDC Bring Your Brave patient education resources and provide a referral for genetic counseling and or testing. Okay, so those are two AIM statements. They're also compound statements. So they're not the best written AIM statements, right? These have to be broken down further. And so we're going to do that next. So what are the family physicians target goals and measures that we're gonna pursue this through this project? They are as follows. By the end of the QI effort, the family physicians target and proven goals for patients meeting the inclusion criteria. And right now, this is just a teaser. We're gonna talk more about this in the third training. But for our purposes here, the inclusion criteria is female patients between the ages of 18 to 44 years, seen during annual physicals, and they are as follows. 50% um, of the patients will have documented in the record that an HBC screening has been completed in the past 12 months. 50% of the HB screenings are documented in the record as having been discussed with the patient. And 90% of the patients who screen positive for high risk for HBC have been documented in the record, and some of the Bring Your Brave resources were offered or provided. And 90% of patients who screen positive on HPC questionnaire, on an HPC questionnaire, have documented in the record that they were referred for genetic counseling or testing. And so in order to do this work, like one of the activities you'll, you'll do with your QI team is you'll want to sit down and you'll want to think through um, what's your, how, how are you going to operationalize this? And so like here, we suggest that you um, do this work uh, based around like well visits or like a physical. But within your own practice, you'll need to discuss how you're going to do HBC uh, screenings and like what's going to work best for your practice the way it's running currently. And then you'll have to think about what modifications you can make to improve any um, processes that you're going to implement. If that makes sense. So if we continue on, we, we're gonna talk now about, we talked about the measures, but we're gonna get more into the key clinical activities and this will happen more in the project structure training that's coming up, but. So we're gonna ask the, far, the participating programs to answer the following questions. And this is gonna be for 10 unique last seen female patients at baseline 
beginning in January 2024, and then for two data collection cycles. So that's going to be two action periods, seven weeks apart. Um, and the things we're going to be measuring are just these three, just these four things. Um, so starting with, has the HPC screening been done and documented in the record? A yes or no. That's a yes or no answer. Um, so in order to get there, though, you have to come up with your plan for how you're going to admit, what screening tool are you going to use? How are you going to administer it? Who's going to be responsible for administering it? Who's going to score it? Who's going to give the information to the provider to um, so that they can discuss the results with the patient? So you can see there's going to be a lot of steps in there to think through. And then of that overarching goal, there's going to be three sub goals. And that's like, that's if, if an HBC screening is positive for high risk, we want you to be able to document in the record whether or not the result was discussed with the patient. And if the HBC screening was positive, we want to, what we want you to, to see you document in the record if a patient had been offered or provided with the Bring Your Brave resources. And then finally, if positive screen, has the patient been referred for genetic counseling or testing? So these were the things that we thought would be most important for practices to start thinking about working on. And we set the goals relatively low. So it's a stretch, especially for practices that aren't doing this at all. That's a stretch. Um, and then for 90% for the ones that are already that are screening positive already, of 10 records you're going to look at, maybe only one out of that 10 will have a positive. Uh, finding for high risk for uh, HBC. Um, and then that's going to be a patient that you're going to want to follow more carefully to make sure they're getting their resources and that they're getting the referrals for genetic counseling or testing. And so in our next training, uh, that's going to be our final training, we're going to drill down even more specifically about the pilot structure, the timeline, the key clinical activities, the measures, and the data collection requirements. And I know that was a lot of information, and I know we're just talking about QA basics, and I, I know that the, the family physicians are, I would say, really far out ahead of some of the other uh, medical specialties or primary care providers in terms of the QI work you're doing, because residents have been doing this for a while, which is great. And as Philip said to me the other day, um, even in medical school, med students are learning about QI. And so I hope this was informative. Um, now I'm going to um, just, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it back over to Philip as our moderator to kind of like wrap this up. And then I want to, if people have any questions, feel free to unmute. And Philip, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Kathy, and uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so, yeah. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to use the raise hand function, put it in the chat, just unmute, uh, however uh, you feel most comfortable um, voicing your questions or comments. I'm going to give a little bit of time here for folks to, mm -hmm. to do that. And if you don't have questions, you know, that's actually fine too. Um, I know you probably... But please chime in. Every it's going to take you a little bit of time to get your things in there. Um, um, but yeah, um, we have a so we have a comment in the chat. Please provide the feedback link. It might be the evaluation, um, uh, and we'll, we'll be getting to that in a second. Um, if you need any more information uh, regarding uh, QI principles, different models, uh, there's several. Um, Links here, though, of course, you can't click on them. I hope that when we go, when we send them the PDF of the slides, they'll be able to click uh, through them. If you don't mind going back to the one slide, I just want to call out just a couple okay. of those. Um, there, Oops. yeah, thanks, thanks, Kathy, putting that okay. in there. So I know that there was the, I think, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, AHRQ. Um, so just some really well-known federal uh, sources for um, for good QI practice. Uh, Juliana says in the chat asks, should we be developing this now or wait until all of our training sessions are complete? So my recommendation is start start working on this now. Uh, like, especially start thinking about that screening tool you're going to want to use. 
That's going to be key. And uh, Dr. Evans talked a bit about the Gale model. And, and I sent out, well, I, I, after this training, it's going to take a day or two, but I'll, I can send out again a, a page of resources that we have for some different screening tools and questionnaires. Um, but like, uh, start familiarizing yourself with that. And then I like just today, I went and I checked out the Gale model and I was looking to see like how easy or hard is it to use that calculator. And I actually, I actually did it for myself and, you know, it was pretty easy to use, but, but it's going to be like, if you were to select that, you would have to think of through how you, how are you going to operationalize it? And I just wanted to point out like Dr. Evans has already done that in practice. And so like, uh, she would be a good resource. We can put people in touch with her, for example. And um, we know uh, Trace, Dr. Tracy Conti is another member of our PAC team. She's already doing this. Um, and so she's going to be a good resource. Um, so yes, please start thinking about it and working on it now. And the next training is in one week. And we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the project. But then that's when the clock starts ticking to actually like try to start, you know, working on this. Yeah. So I think to, if I could summarize uh, the better, you know, the sooner the better, um, especially since the last training is just in a week from now. So if you um, haven't really started thinking about this in a concrete fashion, we encourage you to do so or to at least um, start planning and thinking about this so that if you have any questions about um, implementing this at the next training session, we can address those. Um, yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, and I think we, so here's the link to the, or the link is in the chat for the evaluation. Um, and again, for those, of course, y'all are all here, uh, but for folks who are not able to see it, they'll be able to access the link um, uh, to evaluate as well. Next slide. Please. And so for those of you um, who are, I think some of you might be watching in a group and some of you um, have colleagues who weren't able to participate participate today. Um, and and the QI leaders, um, I'm going to do a follow up email after this this talk, and I'm going to give you the link to the recording. I'm going to give you the, the PDF of the slides and some more resources, and then I'm going to ask you to just push it back out to your group to get as many people to participate in either the live sessions or the recorded sessions. Fantastic. And again, I for the QI leaders who are on the training right now. If, if you have questions and you just don't even know where to start, please reach out to us now. In, um, we already shared with you like who the, who's the QI coach that's going to work as your facilitator. Um, so and I've reached out to um, my people who I'm assigned to. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know that uh, Philip is going to be working with the group and Tracy and Susanna. So feel free to reach out to them or reach out to me and we'll help get you guys moving on this. Yeah. Yeah. Could you uh, go to the next slide um, for, uh, I'm sure you all already have this through the very, oh, I thought, well, okay. My slide deck had one more, uh, which included, uh, I think some uh, emails, some contact if you. Um, yeah. Yeah. One Let's more. see. There. Oh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, um, you can email Scott, um, Kathy, Dr. Evans. You can email me, anyone. Uh, related to this project in any capacity, we'll be happy to answer any questions or um, uh, put you in contact with whomever on our team can best uh, help. So I just want to um, thank you all again for attending tonight, for your participation tonight and in the program overall. Um, and I want to thank Kathy one more time for her excellent presentation on the basics of, of quality improvement. Um, so again, uh, please fill out your evaluation. Send us any questions as you have them. Start thinking about this, and we'll uh, see you in a week. And we hope to continue this discussion and address any barriers or any questions that you might have. Um, so thank you all very much. I hope you have a nice rest of your evening and a and a nice weekend. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>